Today we're going to focus on hymns. I strongly believe that we must teach our children hymns and introduce them to uh, our great heritage of hymns. And otherwise, you know, sometimes uh, we let that slip and we'll have contemporary music in our services sometimes and uh, or they'll have a contemporary service that they go to and they don't have that exposure to hymns. So I think it's important in our rehearsals. And I would suggest uh, a series, you know, uh, throughout the year. Um, and you, there are many ways to do it. You can, uh, you can choose hymns for the church year and have a hymn of the month and have them learn just the first verse of a hymn. Um, you can uh, focus on hymns of Europe, uh, hymns of the, of the Reformation, uh, you know, some of those great hymns of Mighty Fortress and hymns that we don't maybe sing very often sometimes, uh, those kind of hymns. Uh, today, uh, or you can focus also on uh, global music. We've talked a little bit about global music. Choose a different country for a different month and uh, find a, a, a song from that country and, and learn that. Uh, it's a learning experience in relating music to uh, Christendom, uh, the music that is sung and expressed in music. I have chosen to do a series on uh, American hymnody because I think it's fascinating and it kind of puts into context a lot of the, the hymns and songs that we've been singing. I think when they're put into context, it makes a lot more sense about where we are now and, and where we've been. Uh, I don't think we should bore these children with a lot of history. Uh, and uh, we don't want to get into a, a course that's a college course on American hymnody. And that's why this is going to be a very generalized uh, uh, history of American hymnody. Uh, so don't, you know, don't hold me to, <laughs> uh, to not being scholarly and all that kind of thing. But uh, what I usually do, uh, the first month, if we divide this into maybe nine months uh, for the season, uh, the first month we focus on the very earliest hymns in America. When the uh, settlers came to America and uh, settled in New England states, they brought their base songbooks from England. And all at once, these songs were so complicated, the tunes were long, and people were not singing in church. And uh, it didn't fit uh, the American colonies. Uh, it was a, just a different kind of uh, feeling. Uh, it was, there was a, not the sophistication there was in England. And people didn't know what to do. They had congregational meetings about what to do about the songs in their church. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, they said, uh, well, let's learn some new songs and new hymns. And they started these singing schools. And so all of the uh, people would work in the fields all day, chopping wood, planting, and so on. And then they would form these singing schools, and they would meet about three or four times a week at night. And it was a social gathering. They'd all gather together, and they would learn to sing uh, hymns. And not only that, but they would learn how to read hymns. And their system was a little different because these people were, some of them were uneducated. Uh, and so they developed the shape note system. And every note had a different shape. And you can tell, you can write the shapes on, on the board or have posters uh, for the kids. There was a triangle, uh, an oval, uh, a diamond, and, and a square. And they all meant a degree of the scale. Now, I don't think you have to get into singing that shape note scale because that's kind of complicated. But at least tell them this is what their music looked like. Then if you can find a, a copy of shape note, uh, a hymn, maybe get it off the internet. The internet's a wonderful tool, by the way, for all this historical stuff. And, and blow it up and show them this is what a hymn like. This is how they learn to read. And, uh, you know, things that will interest kids. You don't want to be too technical about it, but you want to be, give them something that's kind of fascinating to them. And then, uh, so I've included some, the very first hymn of, in America was All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And it was written by Oliver Holden in 1793. And then you could uh, give them, uh, you could, you know, write out the hymn or show them the hymn in the hymnal. And you could point out uh, the difference between who wrote it and uh, who wrote the words and who wrote the melody. 
when we talk about a hymn and a hymn writer, uh, we're talking about the words, but we're talking about the melody, we're talking about the composer. The first American composer to write a hymn, I mean, the first hymn that was written, first American hymn tune that was written was written by Oliver Holden. So, you can look at that, and uh, we will have the kids sing it, and then we will tell them how maybe they sang it. In their singing schools, they divided the uh, people in half, and half of the choir were basses. Then the other half of the choir were tenors, altos, and sopranos. <laughs> <laughs> the tenors sang the melody, because that was in the high part of their range. And then the uh, sopranos sang kind of a subordinate part, and the altos uh, somewhere in the middle. Can you imagine what that sound was like with all those basses? And so uh, you can ask the kids, what would that sound like? It was a very rugged sound. You know, it wasn't the refined music of Europe like Mozart and Haydn, but it was this, you know, rugged sound, and it fit the American spirit. So uh, I, would probably, I wrote out two parts here, but uh, probably just the melody would be fine. Uh, but uh, here, here's what it would sound like. First of all, I'll play it and let the kids tell me a little bit about what they think it sounds like. They were uh, boisterous Americans, you know, in early America. So let's sing it, okay? And sing it uh, uh, just, you know, good and uh, sturdy. Ready and sing. So uh, these melodies are very beautiful. Now, 
What is a pentatonic uh, melody? It's a melody that can be played on five notes of the scale. You can use all the black notes of the piano. Singing uh, 
other, other songs. They came up with the camp meeting songs. And there, are, uh, there were a lot of camp meeting songs. And unfortunately, we don't know many today because they all died out. They weren't published like the hymns of Northern America. Uh, they didn't have hymnals, so uh, they were just making these up, and everybody was learning to sing them. But one that did survive is Where Are the Hebrew Children? Now, uh, the, uh, these, hymns, these were still pentatonic. The melodies were still pentatonic, but they had uh, a different flavor to them.
and uh, Peter ringing the bells, that means that they made it. And um, then a wade in the water, perhaps was a secret code uh, saying that danger is imminent and they should uh, go down to the water and, and go through the water, wade in the water, get away, uh, cover their tracks, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, somebody's knocking at your door. Uh, when they can start singing down on the plantation, uh-oh, somebody's at the door, danger is coming, this, this kind of thing. There are a lot of uh, documented uh, situations where the spirituals are containing uh, secret messages. Now, Steal Away uh, is also a pentatonic tune, but it has a little different flavor to it, okay? Sing it like uh, with, with deep emotion. Here we go.
it relied on, on harmony, so they had to have uh, uh, some accompaniment. The uh, churches in the larger cities had organs, pipe organs, and in the smaller cities they had uh, pump organs. And this happened in the uh, 1850s, uh, 60s, and 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was referred to as kind of the great gospel era. Uh, then uh, thousands of hymns were written and published. And Fanny Crosby, who was blind from childhood, wrote over 8,000. Can you imagine writing that many hymns? Now, did she write the melodies? No, she wrote the hymns. She was a poet. And she was blind from birth. And uh, she was under the contract with the Methodist Publishing House at one time to write three hymns a week. Now, can you imagine how many hymns appeared during this time? Thousands and thousands. They wrote hymns about every aspect of their life. Uh, they wrote hymns about the railroad, uh, life's railway to heaven. Keep your hand upon the throttle and your eye upon the rail. You know, they, <laughs> they relied on that. Uh, they wrote about harvest, you know, planting. We still sing some of those hymns, even though they kind of don't apply to us today. Uh, we sing about harvesting and bringing in the sheaves and uh, that sort of thing. So we've uh, a lot of those have survived through the years. Do you think that uh, all 8,000 of her hymns have survived? No. If you look in your hymnals, you'll see only a few hymns, uh, probably, that Fanny Crosby wrote. Uh, even though she was a great hymn writer, only a few have survived, and, and probably the best of, uh, of that whole era. Uh, who was Phoebe Knapp? Phoebe Knapp was a friend of hers uh, that wrote music, and they uh, collaborated. They were in the same church, and they uh, collaborated, and she wrote the melody, and Fanny Crosby wrote the words. Then you can ask them about other gospel hymns, and you can sing other gospel hymns uh, that came from this era, uh, leaning on the everlasting arms, you know, uh, we, and didn't we sing that? No, we sang uh, Standing on the Promises the other day. And everybody, and I looked around during the refrain, and everybody was singing on the refrain. Uh, a lot of uh, musicologists, uh, uh, I remember, uh, didn't have a, a real uh, uh, like for, they had a dislike for gospel hymns, and they said every time they sang, they saw a refrain, they did just that. <laughs> I know, I know, boo, boo. But uh, it's interesting because musicians, at one point, uh, I remember when I uh, got my degree in church music at TCU in the 60s, uh, I had grown up with these gospel hymns, and when I got to college, well, uh, you know, I learned that these, this was not the best music, you know, and uh, sometimes... Uh, the theology was, was not as strong as other hymns. And uh, the emphasis was on hymns from Europe, you know, and that was where the best church music was. If, if it came from Europe, it had to be good, you know, and that kind of thing. But now we've come full circle, and we want to appreciate each era for what it was. And uh, some of those gospel hymns that I grew up with, I still remember, and are, they're still meaningful, as they are to a lot of us in as witnessed by the singing that we did the other day, you know, in the services. So uh, it's a great, uh, you know, it's a great time, but here we have all these little different uh, periods in our American history. And the point is that each generation has contributed their music to the, to the uh, time and the music that would fit their culture, uh, and they came up with hymns. Now, that went on for, for many years, and then we come to urban America. And in early America, in the early 20th century, uh, America was becoming more urban. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means people were moving more to the cities rather than uh, on the farms and so on. And in the cities, they built big, beautiful churches. There was Riverside Church in New York, a big cathedral-type church. And you might have to show a picture of it. It's there today, even. Uh, and... Uh, <coughs> The music, the gospel music, just didn't fit these churches. The churches were too, uh, some of them were too gothic, and it just didn't seem quite right to sing, uh, you know, this kind of sing song and gospel music. And so they uh, started singing hymns from Europe. Uh, music schools were developed, like Westminster Choir College, uh, Union Theological Seminary uh, developed their uh, school of music, Northwestern. In Chicago, uh, that's where Peter Lutkin 
was, and he wrote that benediction, that the amen that we all sing. And so these music schools were teaching musicians uh, about church music and, and about fine church music and, and so on. Then something else happened. Uh, in 1929, America start, uh, began the Great Depression. And so people were, were depressed, they were out of work, and uh, they needed hymns that addressed the time. Well, Harry Emerson Fosdick was a seminary professor and he was a pastor of the Riverside Church in New York City. And he wrote the hymn, the words, God of grace and God of glory. If you look at those words, and try to think about what the people were experiencing. Crown thy ancient church's story, bring her bud to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. And what was the hour they were facing? Well, a very uh, difficult time in, in America. So uh, he wrote the words and then he found this tune uh, that a, a Welshman had written. Uh, John Hughes, and he put his words with that tune. And then they came up with this. Now, this hymn, when you play it, uh, you can ask the kids, does this sound like a gospel hymn, or is it a little bit different?
there were the civil rights. It was just a very turbulent time, and the hymns that we they sang in their churches didn't quite fit the the, the people, the protest people, the flower children. They wanted to sing folk music, and uh, the folk music is a people uh, uh, music that comes from the people, and it, it usually expresses a message. So they. Uh, started singing a lot of folk music, and a lot of folk music started appearing in churches. There, was, there were guitars uh, all at once in churches. Had they ever used guitars in church music before? Well, yes, way, way, way back they did. So now here they are again. They're playing their guitars, and they're writing their own music, and, uh, uh, and it's, it's maybe in a different style. And so listen to this one. Uh, Sing that, 
And then that began happening more and more. Uh, more Christian groups began um, uh, coming about. And then, uh, so today, we have all kinds of, of contemporary music that we have. And our services have changed because sometimes we'll have screens up there instead of hymnals. Uh, did the early people have hymnals? No, they, they sang together with each other and they didn't have hymnals. And we don't have hymnals now, but we have screens. Uh, does that mean we're never going to have hymnals? No, because we're, uh, we're a people now that are aware of what all these things have happened in history. So we're bringing all of this together and we can use uh, everything. We can use uh, hymns from different periods. That's, that's the time that we live in right now. Uh, and you can sing, you can choose any kind of contemporary song. Uh, I chose this one, which was written in 1988, uh, but it was at the top of the charts uh, even in the 2000s. You know, uh, is, it, is it a difficult song to sing? No. Uh, it, uh, it uses the word awesome. Have you heard the word awesome used before? <laughs> uh, and it sort of came from our time. So uh, let's let's sing this and uh, and then tell me kind of what the style is, okay? Uh -huh. Church music, but that's not a threat to me. 
uh, that makes me want to even more choose the best of what's happening. There are some beautiful contemporary uh, songs that we've sung some of them in, in worship. Some hymns of Stuart Townen, uh, and Christ Alone in Christ Alone. Uh, there at the bottom of Paris, uh, Lamb of God. I remember when I first sang that, I thought, I sang it at the top of my lungs with everybody else. And I thought, yeah, it was like I'd sung it for years. And it was just a, a beautiful song, that a beautiful tune that, that connected. And that, to me, is the most important thing. Uh, it has to be inspired. Uh, I think there is so much music out there that is uninspired, <coughs> and it's not going to last. What about the 8,000 hymns <laughs> Fanny Crosby wrote? Bless her heart. You know, she, uh, she, poured, you know, she poured a lot of effort into it, as did a lot of the other gospel hymn writers. But that music didn't survive. Not all of it. Some of the best did. And that's what I think is going to happen today. I think some of the best contemporary songs are going to survive. We've already lost some of the ones that we thought were popular back in the 70s. And we've kind of pushed them aside. So anyway, I've rattled on and on up here. Uh, I, I've done half of this section in terms of what you need to present to children. And half of it is just <laughs> giving you a, a thumbnail sketch of of history. So uh, I go back to what I said at the beginning. If you're going to teach children about these different periods, try to make it a little bit more childlike, not quite so historical, but just give a few facts about each, each period and then they can appreciate that and learn those hymns.